So, are you getting tired of tempestuous, egocentric superstars? You're about to get a break. In this lecture, I'm turning first to our third High Renaissance superstar, Raphael Sanzio da Urbino. Raphael was, according to numerous testimonies by contemporaries, a genuinely nice guy. Although he died young at 37, Raphael left a large body of work. The School of Athens is probably his most famous painting, and it's our required work. But you know the drill by now. I want you to see more paintings by Raphael. I thought you'd be especially interested in the self-portrait sketch he drew when he was just 14. Raphael was born and raised in Urbino under the reign of its warrior humanist duke, pictured above in a famous double portrait by an early Renaissance master whom, alas, we are otherwise passing over. His father was a court painter who apprenticed Raphael to Perugino. Raphael's early works, as you can see, were heavily influenced by Perugino, whose painting of Christ handing the keys to St. Peter is on the left. I've cropped the Perugino painting to make the comparison easier. The similarities between these two paintings are pretty obvious, but what big difference do you notice? Raphael's painting has stronger colors and more distinct faces because he was painting in oil. Light, bright colors tended to work better with fresco and tempera, while one of the many advantages of oil paint was that layers of paint and glazes permitted deeper tones. Remember that the Italians are coming to know the great oil paintings of Northern Renaissance, especially the works of Jan van Eyck. In his early 20s, Raphael left Urbino for Florence, and this painting dates from that period. Among Raphael's many admirable character traits was that he admired and happily borrowed from other great artists. So which artist is Raphael channeling here? If you guess Leonardo da Vinci, you're right. Notice the pyramidal composition and the setting of the Madonna in a beautiful landscape without halos or thrones. We also see chiaroscuro and even a hint of sfumato in the slightly blurred lines. But Raphael's Madonnas, and he painted a lot of them, are sweeter and a little less mysterious than Leonardo's. And his setting is the gentler, less dramatic, and less fantastical landscape of his native Urbino. Here's a later Raphael Madonna painted toward the end of his sadly short life, when the painter had moved to Rome and gained Pope Julius II's sponsorship. The kneeling saint, the early Christian Saint Sixtus, has the face of Julius II. Note the mystical setting and the greater three-dimensional bulk of the figures, but once again Raphael employs the highly stable, triangular, or pyramidal composition. The little angels at the bottom have, by the way, become famous images. Again, they show Raphael's remarkable talent for capturing individual expression. Here are two Raphael portraits. The portrait on the left is Castiglione, author of a famous book, The Courtier, which described the ideal Renaissance gentleman. I love the piercing eyes and the exquisitely rendered textures of the cloth. Raphael was paying attention to what painters were up to in Flanders. I included the portrait of a woman because Raphael, unlike our previous two superstars, preferred women to men in his sexual life, and I think he paints women with great sensitivity and affection. And here, finally, is our required Raphael work, The School of Athens. Raphael moved to Rome in 1508 and would spend the last 12 years of his life there working for two popes, Julius II and his successor, Leo X, who was, by the way, the second son of Lorenzo de' Medici. Julius immediately commissioned Raphael to produce frescoes for what was intended to become the Pope's private rooms at the Vatican Palace. This fresco was painted for the Sala della Segnatura, now the room where the Pope signs official papal documents. But when Raphael was painting this room, it was Julius II's private library and study, and the paintings reflected his wide intellectual interests, as well as his belief that classical and Christian ideas not only could, but should be reconciled. One danger of this laser-like focus on the philosophy fresco is that it's easy to forget that it was just one of four paintings in Pope Julius's library. He also commissioned Raphael frescoes portraying poetry, jurisprudence, that's law, and theology. Binding these together was the theme of wisdom, which Pope Julius II saw as emanating from all of these sources. I thought this video clip from a full-length documentary about Raphael presents an interesting analysis of the School of Athens. It also provides somewhat different information than the Khan Academy video. This is going to be the main discussion of this work today, so don't tune out, okay? 
I'll just quickly recap a few points. One of the many reasons why art historians love this painting is they get to pe play spot the famous guy. Here are a few famous contemporaries of Raphael masquerading as Greek sages. Here's Euclid, Bramante masquerading as Euclid. And here in the center is Raphael himself. Here we see Plato pointing to the heavens, reflecting his more abstract concerns, while Aristotle, more grounded in this world, is pointing to the earth. The red of Plato's tunic symbolizes fire, or spirit, which rises up from the brown. Brown symbolizes earth. And here we get a sense of the entire room, and again, the range of the Pope's intellectual interest. And now that we've sped through Raphael, we are really going to speed through the works of the Venetian artists. Venice is different from the rest of Italy. During the Middle Ages and into the Renaissance, the city's fortunes were built on maritime trade with the East, and Venice had much stronger ties to Byzantium than anywhere else in Italy. Venetians of the upper class did not attend humanist academies. They were sent to sea as boys. As a result, the interests of the ruling patron class tended to be less intellectual, more focused on nature, and more sensual as well. But above all, Venice was and is a city bathed in light, light bouncing off its canals, light reflecting from the mosaics that decorated its Byzantine-style churches, including St. Mark's, and light shining through its most famous product, glass. No, this is not a Renaissance painting. It's an Impressionist painting of Venice by Monet, but it captures Venice's extraordinary light. And okay, I couldn't resist. Another Monet, this time a sunset. Let's turn to today's second video for a discussion of Venice and its art. I'm going to quickly show a few paintings by famous Venetian artists, starting with Bellini. What I want you to pay attention to is how these painters use color and light. Let me just note that the ever-grumpy Michelangelo accused Venetian painters of paying too little attention to drawing. Sure, they were masters of color and paint, but what about line? What about shape? See if you agree with Michelangelo's criticism. Here we can compare Bellini's marriage painting with Raphael's Marriage of the Virgin. They're both oil paintings, and both artists use color masterfully. But Bellini, typical of Venetian painters, use softer layered colors. Raphael's oil painting still in many ways resembles tempera paintings with their sharp, bright colors. Like Van Eyck and Leonardo, the Venetians explored the potential of oil paint for producing more subtle gradations of color. Notice too the much more powerful role played by light in the Bellini painting. The two saints in the foreground, St. Peter and St. Jerome, are cast into shadow. The virgin and child are bathed in a light that seems to be emanating from a real source. We'll see much more of this when we get to Baroque art. With this painting by Giorgione, we again see the subtle gradations of subdued color and the play of light and shadow. But this painting also represents another important aspect of Venetian art. I've already said the Venetians were less focused on the intellect, more focused on the senses. Nature plays a more central role in many Venetian paintings in what is called here a pastoral mood. There's a romantic, sentimental feel to this work that, to my mind, recalls Botticelli, but with softer lines and colors. By the way, this painting's juxtaposition of nude females and clothed men would be copied by many later artists. Stay tuned. Titian is the last of our superstars, but since I'm running out of time, he is not going to get the attention he deserves. Titian painted this self-portrait when he was about 70 years old. He had a long, rich career, and there are a lot of Titians out there for you to see. Titian began his artistic career apprentice to a mosaicist, which may contribute to his use of reflective light, but he, then he went on to work for Bellini. Eventually, he became the most sought-after painter in Europe. He worked for kings and emperors throughout Europe, and of course, he worked for popes. This masterwork was actually Titian's first major composition. The brilliant light shows Titian's mosaic past and also the Venetians' debt to Byzantine art. But the combination of stability and movement is characteristic of the high Renaissance, especially of Michelangelo. Again, you see strong colors and vibrant light combined with Titian's superb skills as a portraitist. To my mind, this is one of the most beautiful and human Marys in Italian art. Note, too, the foreshadowing of God the Father. Titian has learned from his fellow Italian masters. Titian also loved to paint pastoral scenes and mythological scenes. This painting combines the two. It's based on a Greek myth. Jupiter falls in love with the princess Europa. He takes on the form of a beautiful white bull and persuades the girl to climb on his back. 
As soon as she does, the bull makes for the sea, takes her off to Crete, where, well, you can guess the rest of the story. The result was an offspring, King Minos, and the birth of European civilization. The continent was named after the princess. I decided to include this painting in my lecture after I found this juxtaposition on the internet. On the right, we see a close-up of the section of Europa's clothing marked out by the rectangle, and it gives us an opportunity to observe Titian's brush strokes. It's harder to identify brush strokes in, say, a painting by Van Eyck. They're small, meticulous, well-blended, and largely hidden. The term art critics use for this kind of brush stroke is tight. Titian employed looser brush strokes, often large swaths of paint that can be readily identified. The term art critics use for this is loose brush strokes, and we'll see a lot more of these in our next unit. They also use the term painterly, which you just heard in the video and may have wondered about. Painterly refers to works where the act of painting is made obvious, such as by employing highly visible brush strokes. Okay, on to our required work. I borrowed this slide, and when I tried to make it more readable, I just got it messed up. So let's live with it. As the diagrams indicate, this painting has an interesting... Let's see if I can finish it. Good. Uh, composition, an inverted pyramid with diagonals that are connected both by line and color. Notice how the two smaller figures on the right balance the reclining nude, as do the red of her cushion and her serving woman's skirt. Remember, too, that red and green are complementary colors that draw the eye. We don't actually know that the Venus of Urbino was Venus. The title was added later. But it's interesting to compare these two paintings because they say something about the ideal of beauty in Renaissance Italy. Note that both women have small, firm breasts and swelling stomachs, and that, unlike Michelangelo's women, they don't seem to have any muscle tone. The Italians also admired blondes, even though most Italian women had dark hair. But if this is a Venus, Titian has taken a huge leap by putting her into a domestic setting filled with details about an upper-class Venetian room. In part, this showed the influence of the northern painters, whose work Titian knew well. Titian's paintings of naked women greatly influenced later artists. Stay tuned for Rubens. The painting on the right, made 400 years later, was a direct homage to Titian's work and will be one of our required works in another couple of months. So I'd like to close out with one last rather long video segment that talks about both of these works. I was very intrigued by this art critic's discussion of how art historians' view of Titian's work has changed with the times. This is very relevant to the College Board's current preoccupations. So I hope there's time. Warning, the really important part comes at the end, and it is not every art historian's view of the painting. But it's an interesting theory and a reminder that there are a lot of theories out there. I figure this frees us up a little to come.